In this video, I will show you how a team of staff, students and interns from the Aerospace Systems Lab at the University of Manchester made a fully autonomous foam board jet plane in 40 days. Why did we do this? Short answer is, we're engineers, why not? The longer answer is that we hadn't worked with jets for a while and we wanted to get our expertise back up to speed. We also wanted to try out a new research technique for measuring flow in flight using just a GoPro camera and a speckle pattern in the background called background orientated Schlieren. Our starting point was that we already had a small jet engine available from another project in the lab. All we had to do was build a plane to put it in. A short planning meeting over coffee ended with the outcome of, hey, let's do this. And since we were going flight testing anyway in a month, we could test our jet plane at the same time. A Gantt chart was produced and the project was set in motion. So how hard is it actually to design a jet plane? As a disclaimer, we really should know what we're doing as we run undergraduate courses on aircraft design and aero robotics from the lab. We also run an annual aerospace engineering field course where students build fixed and rotary wing aircraft and launch rockets. We had also produced giant foam board aircraft before in the lab, but never powered by a jet engine. Now to the technical bit. How actually do you go about designing and making something that has never existed before? Well, it all starts with requirements. This is where you write down exactly what the thing you are making needs to do or achieve. Design without requirements is art, which is fine, but it's not engineering. So what were the requirements for our jet? It had to be quick to build, simple to transport, and easy to fly. Quick to build means that all the component parts had to be designed for making using a laser cutter or by 3D printing. It would still take quite a long time to assemble the aircraft, but that was okay if everything fitted together right first time. Use of foam board as the main structural material also makes building easier, as the main joining methods are hot glue and tape. This means anyone can help with the building without having to do a lot of training. Simple to transport means that it can fit in the back of a van, and to do this, the aircraft had to break down into component parts that were no longer than four meters in length. To make the permission to fly easy, the aircraft all up mass was limited to be less than 25 kilograms, which allows operation under the UK Civil Aviation Authority open category for drones. To make the pilot's job easy, the aircraft is fitted with an open source autopilot, meaning the pilot commands the aircraft like it is in a video game. The aircraft can also fly itself if needed. Whilst there are lots of details to get right in an aircraft design, there are also some simple choices you can make to get a good head start. These include how big the wing is compared to the weight of the aircraft, wing loading, and the amount of thrust compared to the weight of the aircraft, thrust to weight ratio. Getting these quantities right is called aircraft sizing, and it is usually done as part of a constraints analysis. Next up is the choice of configuration. For this design, simplicity of engine mounting and easy access was important, so we decided early on that the configuration would be one with the engine mounted at the back of the fuselage. The tail is then attached using twin booms joined to the wings. Designing an aircraft to balance under aerodynamic loads in flight is quite a tricky process. Fortunately, there are several rules of thumb for things like how big to make the tail and where to put it, and where the centre of mass should be relative to the centre of lift of the aircraft. The process is to use various calculation methods of increasing sophistication and then check the answers against what the rules of thumb tell you. If the answers are very different, then you've probably made a mistake somewhere in your calculation. The structure of the aircraft is a significant contribution to its overall mass and needs designing carefully. For this aircraft, the structural mass is at least half the all-up mass. If the airframe was made of solid foam board, it would have a mass of around 50 kilograms. The actual mass is around 10 kilograms, so that means 80% of the aircraft is empty space. The wing spar is the structural part that holds the aircraft up when it is flying, and it is the single heaviest structural component. 
Its required strength depends both on the mass of the aircraft and how many Gs it will pull in flight. A load limit of 2.5 G was set and the required spar cross-section shape was worked out from structures theory using a spreadsheet analysis tool. As well as a wing, aircraft need an undercarriage so that they can support themselves on the ground when the wings aren't producing any lift. The undercarriage is arranged so that around 90% of the aircraft's weight acts on the main gear, meaning that the nose gear can be quite lightweight. A hard landing is the limiting design case. The point where the main gear is attached to the fuselage is typically the strongest part of the aircraft. Now let's consider detailed design. This is where hundreds of hours of work go into turning a preliminary design into something that can be manufactured. For the final design, there are about 180 individual parts. Most of these are laser cut. Laser cutting typically takes a couple of minutes per part, and thus it's possible to do all the laser cutting for the aircraft in a day. The build phase of the project took about 20 person days total, spread over a week, and most of the jobs parallelize well, so there's a lot of speed up as you add more people to the job. The systems fit for the avionics and flight controls was done by four people in around four days. These guys really knew what they were doing. There are a lot of checks to do before being ready to fly. One of the most critical is the center of mass check. With the aircraft fully assembled, weighing scales were put under each wheel and the location of the center of mass was worked out by taking moments about the leading edge. Additional ballast masses were then added to the aircraft to move the center of mass to where it needs to be for the aircraft to balance in flight. A flight simulation model of the aircraft was built using the Aerodynamic Objects Toolkit in Unity. The flight simulation allows evaluation of the flight dynamic behaviour of the chosen centre of mass location of the aircraft. It also provides a tool for evaluating the behaviour of the autopilot without actually having to fly the aircraft. Lastly, the simulation is useful for pilot training, particularly for recovering the aircraft when things go very wrong. Finally, to flight testing. Here we are at Snowdonia Aerospace Centre in North Wales in the UK. The predicted takeoff run of our aircraft is only a few tens of metres, so we're operating from an apron in front of the hangar instead of a runway. The first flight nearly ended in disaster. The main undercarriage detached from the fuselage during the takeoff run, but the aircraft managed to get airborne, did some circuits, and eventually made a successful emergency landing on the grass. We also found from this flight that quite a lot of the covering film had peeled away from the upper surfaces of the wing. We were lucky that despite the loss in aerodynamic performance, the aircraft still managed to fly well enough to get back home. Sounds like you're ringing a funeral bell. <laughs> <laughs> On the second flight, misalignment of the tail boom meant that there was not enough control power to rotate during takeoff, and the aircraft ran off the apron and into the grass. On the third flight, the takeoff was successful, and we managed some good flight time to tune the autopilot. We also got some great results from our in-flight background orientated Schlieren experiment. On the fourth flight, everything came good and we had a fully successful takeoff, auto mission and landing. Also, since our more experienced pilots were not available, I got promoted to pilot for this flight, which was the first time I'd ever flown a jet plane. It had been on my bucket list for a long time, but I never thought I would actually do it.
So, what did we learn from this project? Here are my big three conclusions. Most of these are pretty well worn, but I think it's worth remaking them here. Firstly, big decisions made at the start are often made quickly, but the quality of these decisions has a huge impact on the subsequent time taken and the ultimate success or failure of the project. If your requirements are badly posed, your project is doomed to failure from the start, however smart you are or however hard you work. Two, the most time efficient way of making a successful aircraft is to solve all the problems, however small, at the detailed design stage with pen and paper or computer. Solving or fixing problems later on the fly during manufacturing and assembly always takes longer and leads to mistakes and extra work. Lastly, number three, a successful aircraft depends on 100% of the critical decisions being at least 80%. It is the thing that you have overlooked that gets you, not the problem you have only 80% solved. So, what's next? Our current jet configuration was based on ease of engine placement. Next up is embedding the jet inside the fuselage, which requires intakes and an exhaust tube that gets hot. Also, how about a little less drag and a bit more speed? Looking forward to the next crazy adventure already. Mm -hmm.